the wife of Henry VIII, awoke in the royal apartments at the Tower of London. Her ladies-in-waiting made their final preparations. The time will come. This would be an unprecedented day in the country's history. Today, England would have a new queen, the climax of a passionate love affair that had driven the king to divorce his wife. Henceforth, my heart shall be dedicated to you alone. As she emerged outside, thousands of excited spectators cheered, greeting her for the very first time. To have her as his queen, Henry had moved heaven and earth. He had annulled his previous marriage and broken ties with Rome so that he could become the supreme head of a new Church of England. But the joy of Anne's coronation wouldn't last. Less than three years later, Anne would be back in the tower for a very different reason. She would be queen for only a thousand days. O oh Lord, have mercy on me. To Christ, I commend my soul. It had taken Henry and Anne seven long and difficult years to get together. Now I'll be retracing their footsteps and piecing together the evidence to try and understand why it took just three years for their relationship to fall apart in such a tragic and violent way. Oh Lord God, have mercy on my soul. Please to receive my soul. Oh, Lord God, have mercy on my soul. When Anne became queen, she was already pregnant. Anne had held out the promise that she would give Henry the son and heir that he needed to secure the Tudor dynasty. But Anne failed to fulfill that promise. She gave birth to a girl, Elizabeth. It was a massive disappointment. Catherine of Aragon, a loyal wife and queen for over 20 years, had already been unceremoniously discarded for being unable to deliver a son. Henry had seen this failure as a stain on his image, and image was everything in the world of the Tudors. Henry needed to be seen as a king who could continue his dynasty. This is a cartoon that was prepared by Hans Holbein, a sketch. And it is such an insight into how Henry wanted to be seen. Because for a start, he's actually taller than he was in real life. We've compared his armor with this picture and we found that actually he's been stretched but the key message of this picture is told by the shapes of Henry's body. So it forms two triangles. We've got the broad shoulders that form a triangle tapering to the waist and the splayed feet that taper also up to focus the gaze on his bulging codpiece, which his hands frame and which the several bows above. Because this picture is all about masculinity and virility and fertility and potency. It's no wonder that we think of Henry as this man of lusts, when in actual fact he had trouble siring an heir, because this picture tells us what to think. That's why there are so many copies of this picture, because if you were a courtier who had any nous at all, you'd get yourself a copy of this picture to show that you were on message. Henry and Anne's marriage came under intense pressure from the very beginning. 
England's future depended on their ability to reproduce. A song composed for Anne's coronation made the new Queen's duties explicit. It was called the White Falcon, the falcon being Anne's heraldic badge and a symbol of grace, purity and fertility. This white falcon, rare and precious, this bird shineth so bright. Of all that are no bird compare, may with this falcon white. Of body small, of power regal she is, and sharp of sight. In chastity excelleth she, most like an angel bright. That she may bring fruit according for such a falcon white. Herself repose upon the rose, now may this falcon white. The symbolism is clear. As king and queen, Henry and Anne were expected to produce a male heir. Under such pressure, Anne's increasing desperation began to show. Less than a year after Elizabeth's birth, rumours circulated that the queen was once again of a goodly belly. But mysteriously, there's no record of either a miscarriage or indeed a birth. Well, it suggests to me that maybe it was a case of pseudosiasis or phantom pregnancy, which happened particularly in the 16th century before the age of scans or pregnancy tests, when women who desperately wanted to be pregnant would have all the symptoms of pregnancy, but there was no baby. Which expresses just how much Anne was desperate to give Henry what he wanted. Henry's obsession wasn't the only burden on their marriage. There were still many Roman Catholics who refused to accept Anne as their queen. This conflict would lead to bloodshed. Henry VIII had paid a heavy price to marry Anne Boleyn. In removing the Pope's authority over England, he had made Catholic enemies at home and abroad. To protect his own position, the king needed the loyalty of his subjects, and he was prepared to create new laws and use force to get it. In 1534, Henry's government passed the Act of Supremacy, which said that Henry was and always had been supreme head of the Church of England. They just hadn't noticed it recently. And following on the heels of that was the Act of Succession. This said that Anne was his lawful queen and any children they had would be the true heirs to the throne. And all English subjects were required to swear that this was the case. And some people found this very hard to swallow. Those that refused to swear the oath were treated as traitors. This is Charterhouse in central London. In the 16th century, it was a flourishing monastery, and at its head was Prior John Houghton. He would pay the ultimate price for defying Henry. Houghton and many of his monks refused to swear that oath of succession. And so in April 1535, 10 of them were taken to Newgate Prison. And within fewer than three weeks, they were tried, convicted and executed for treason. And we have an astonishing account of their execution. A foreign report on the gruesome event was graphic. What it said was this, they were dragged to the place of execution in their habits to the great grief of the people. They were hanged, cut down before they were dead, opened, and their bow and hearts burned. Their heads were then cut off and their bodies quartered. 
And another report adds the shocking detail that the executioner caused them to be ripped up in each other's presence, their arms torn off, their hearts cut out and rubbed upon their mouths and faces. And the barbarity of this act was blamed directly on the King of England himself. Far from easing the pressure on Henry and Anne's marriage, the deaths of these dissenters only amplified it. They needed a son more than ever to justify their actions. But even though their relationship was under great strain, they certainly weren't showing it. I've come to a castle in Gloucestershire. It's a place that reminds us that for more than two years, they were happily married and still in love. The royal couple came here for 10 days in the summer of 1535, just a few months after the bloodshed at Charterhouse. Today, it's an upmarket hotel. Hello. Hello, welcome to Thornbury Castle. Thank you, uh, my name's Lipscomb. I've got the keys to a unique hotel room. Now, it's pretty unusual to stay in any room that a king and queen have slept in, but one that Henry and Anne have stayed in is a rare and thrilling experience. Of course, it's hard enough to know what goes on behind closed doors in modern relationships, let alone at a distance of almost 500 years. But what we do know is what other people said about Henry and Anne. And what they said is that Henry and Anne were merry together. In fact, Henry and Anne were described as being merry together more than Henry and his other wives, including throughout the summer and autumn of 1535 when they were staying here. But the other thing we know about their relationship is that it was a relationship of sunshine and storms. They quarrelled and they made up. They had fights and then they had ardent reunions. Henry and Anne were now two and a half years into their marriage and as 1535 drew to a close, all seemed well in their world. In 1536 should have been a great year for Henry and Anne. The king was now supreme head of the Church of England, and any son that they had would be the legitimate heir to the throne. And things were looking optimistic on that front, because Anne was pregnant again. The couple's good fortune continued with the first major event of that year. On the 7th of January, 1536, Catherine of Aragon, Henry's first wife, had died after a short illness. In the eyes of Rome and Catholic Europe, Catherine was still the legitimate Queen of England. Her nephew was the Spanish King, Charles V, a serious threat to Henry's reign. On the day his ex-wife died, Henry was busy partying at court. No one could now dispute his marriage to Anne. If there's ever a true victim in this story, it's Catherine of Aragon. She gave more than 20 years of her life to this man who would ultimately discard and humiliate her. Her only crime was her failure to give Henry a healthy son. For that, she was exiled from court and her daughter, Mary, declared a bastard. As a final humiliation, Catherine was denied a state funeral at St Paul's or Westminster Abbey. Instead, she was buried here at Peterborough Cathedral.
I find it quite moving and sad to be here by Catherine's grave. Catholics viewed Catherine as a martyr, and her story is so tragic that people still want to mark her life. Look at all this. People have brought flowers and posies, and the pomegranate, her symbol to remember her by. So Catherine remains an inspiration. Henry and Anne treated her with utter contempt. So self-absorbed were they. Ultimately, she would be just another victim of their destructive love affair. Henry had weathered a political and religious storm over his divorce from Catherine. Now Anne was expecting a child that would surely be a son. Henry appeared to have come through the other side with pride and honour intact. But I believe it was Henry's overwhelming desire to maintain honour that would ultimately destroy the marriage for which he'd fought so hard. Just 17 days after Catherine's death, Henry and Anne's relationship suffered a major blow. Like everyone else in the 16th century, Henry VIII was obsessed with honour. And honour was associated with masculinity, with upholding patriarchy, with controlling one's household and maintaining one's good name. Masculinity was an essential part of kingship. It was vital that Henry excelled over all. He was a champion on the tilt yard, an expert jouster. But his youth and athleticism were fading. And his love for dangerous sports would now prove life-threatening. Henry fell from his horse whilst jousting. He suffered a major blow to the head. The king was reported to be unconscious for over two hours. Such a severe head injury could be partly responsible for the marked change in Henry's personality. He became an increasingly brutal and cruel king. We understand that the young Henry was very different from Henry in the later years of his life, and there were a couple of ideas about why that could be and how his brain might have been involved. If he underwent damage to the frontal lobe of the brain. It's this part here, just behind the forehead. And if he hit the ground very hard, then the front part of the brain could bash against the skull and cause damage to this area. And the reason why that's important is that the frontal lobe here, the biggest lobe of our brain, is the area responsible for our personalities and our behavior. It processes our experiences and makes us the people that we are. And we know that people who have damage to the frontal lobe, it may just exacerbate character traits that they, they already have. So if they're slightly grumpy, they may, after their injury, be very grumpy. Often people say it's like a completely different person, and so their characteristics change completely. So it's possible that that's what happened to Henry. We also know that the impact of his fall opened up an old ulcer in Henry's left leg, which would never heal. We know that actually Henry's physicians did try to drain his ulcers and they used hot irons, almost like a hot poker, mm. that they pushed into his, le into his ulcer with no anaesthetic. Mm. And that can't have done very much for his temper. And worse was to come. Henry's jousting accident would be blamed for the next disaster to strike at the heart of Henry and Anne's marriage. Less than a week after Henry's near-fatal fall, Anne miscarried. <laughs> she 
she blamed her miscarriage on her shock at hearing the news of the king's fall. The fetus was three and a half months old, old enough for them to be able to tell that it would have been a boy. Although they loved each other, the success of Henry and Anne's marriage had always depended on having a son. The Spanish ambassador Eustace Chapuis wrote that Anne had miscarried of her saviour. He believed that the Queen had sealed her fate. Well, we know that Henry was distraught. Reports said that he showed great distress and great disappointment and sorrow at the loss of this child. He's reported to have said, I see that God will not give me male children. Henry had seen his failure to sire a son with his previous wife, Catherine, as a sign that God disapproved of his first marriage. Was the miscarriage a sign that Anne didn't have God's backing either? Following Anne Boleyn's miscarriage, rumours circulated in court that Henry VIII had lost interest in his wife. Anne was never a popular queen, and without a son, she was exposed to those at court who would rejoice at her downfall. And they would have been delighted to hear gossip that Henry was seeing another woman. Our evidence comes from the Spanish ambassador Eustace Chapuis a wily character and a staunch Roman Catholic who never disguised his hatred for Anne, the woman whom he called the concubine. Lubaldino writes that he has heard in France that Anna Boulan had in some way or other incurred the royal displeasure and that she is in disgrace with the king who is paying his court with another lady and that the people are uttering words of much indignation against Anne. The other lady that Chapuis refers to is Jane Seymour. Jane was a lady in waiting to the Queen, just as Anne had once been to Catherine. The Spanish ambassador wrote that Henry had sent a letter to Jane accompanied by a purse full of sovereigns. It was possibly a summons to his bedroom. Jane didn't open the letter and instead sent back the purse and the letter saying that she was the daughter of good and honourable parents and that if the king wanted to make her a present of money, perhaps he'd do so at the time that God decided to give her an advantageous marriage. It does look a little like Jane is playing hard to get. Perhaps because she hoped that the advantageous marriage would be with Henry himself. But I don't believe Henry was planning to marry Jane. It was normal practice for kings at this time to have mistresses, and there's absolutely no evidence that Henry was thinking of abandoning Anne, or indeed that he'd even fallen out of love with her. In fact, Henry was still increasing pressure on the Spanish king, Charles V, to recognize Anne as his queen. But then fate intervened delivering a blow so powerful that it would tear Henry and Anne's relationship apart. Scandalous rumours began to spread through the court that the Queen had been having sexual relations with other men, some close to the King. Why these allegations surfaced and who was behind them is still fiercely debated. Was she guilty of the charges against her? Were the dark forces behind the scenes plotting her downfall? Was Anne the victim of court gossip? Did careless talk cost lives? We know that Anne could be feisty and sometimes even flirtatious, but it's extremely doubtful that Anne would commit adultery. Frustratingly, we don't have the evidence to give us a clear picture of what was going on. 
But perhaps we can understand Anne's downfall through a more recent royal scandal. Former courtier Patrick Jefferson was Princess Diana's private secretary. I think there are some parallels with Diana there, where some of her critics, uh, some of them quite close to, to the royal establishment, have tried to paint her as a loose cannon. Whereas the truth was, she was an extremely dutiful princess. Well, Diana was painted as this woman who had many lovers. Anne was, of course, as well. And it's extraordinary to me that 500 years later, the way you can really blacken a woman's name is to suggest that she's some sort of sexual predator. I think they were both very sassy women. And you can't sass around in court and not expect to, uh, to bear the consequences sooner or later. When your usefulness has been outlived, then you better watch out. In other words, they would find anything they could to condemn her in the eyes of the world. It seems to be at the heart of this question about Henry and Anne is the question of scandal. Um, and of course, you have been in, in a court that had a certain amount of scandal <laughs> associated with it. Well, I mean, what can we learn from that? Scandal is one way in which courtiers or those who make their living from the court are able to sort out their own pecking order. And when scandal doesn't exist, then there will always be somebody around to create it. And I think the extraordinary thing about Henry is my conviction is that he does genuinely believe that she's committed adultery. Because there would be nobody who wanted to keep their head on their shoulders who was going to tell him he got it wrong. And this is why today I think it is still the case that to give advice to a royal person, let alone tell a royal person they're getting it wrong, that's quite an art. And I don't know how many people have got that art or want to exercise it. There is nobody, I think, today who will tell senior members of the royal family that they're getting it wrong. According to one account, when rumors of Anne's infidelity reached Henry, he was shocked and his color changed. He immediately ordered an investigation into the allegations. Arguably the most damaging and hurtful of these involved adultery and treason with one of the king's oldest friends, Henry Norris. Norris was a gentleman of Henry VIII's privy chamber and a groom of the stall, a role that traditionally entailed wiping the royal bottom. In reality, it meant that Norris was Henry's closest companion, someone he truly trusted. But in Henry's court, walls had ears. No one was immune from the deadly consequences of rumor and gossip. In an indiscreet conversation, the Queen was said to have asked Norris why he hadn't got married yet. And when he replied that he would tarry a time, Anne said, You look for dead men's shoes. For if aught came to the King but good, you would look to have me. In other words, you want to marry me when my husband's dead, don't you? Norris's response, that he'd rather his head were off, suggests he knew that they'd committed a serious faux pas. They had imagined the king's death, which under the Treasons Act was illegal. Henry launched an investigation into Norris's conduct, along with many others who were suspected of having had sexual intercourse with the queen, among them her own brother, George. <laughs> Anne's final downfall was swift and sudden. It began with what should have been a day of celebration for the king and queen at Greenwich Palace. It was May Day, they were at a tournament. They were having a very nice time until some unwelcome news arrived for Henry. It turned out that a musician who'd been interrogated, possibly under torture, had confessed to sexual intercourse with Anne on three occasions. It's my opinion that Henry believed the accusations, and they had the power to destroy his masculine honor, something he valued more than his love for Anne. Henry couldn't be seen as a king who had no control over his wife. He abruptly left Greenwich, taking Norris with him, and whatever was said on that journey back to London was enough to convince Henry that his closest friend was guilty too. Norris would end up on the scaffold. 
Henry would never see Anne again. She would never have a chance to meet her husband, to talk it through, to give her side of the story, to protest her innocence. That same night, alone at Greenwich Palace, Anne was given all the usual attention of a queen. She was still completely unaware that her life was unravelling. Early in the morning on the 2nd of May, Anne was taken from Greenwich to the tower by barge. She had no idea why. She could never have imagined that she was experiencing her final moments of freedom. She traveled in through this water gate in St. Thomas's Tower, now known as Traitor's Gate. In those days, the Thames came up all the way to these stairs. And of course, we have this sense, with hindsight, that that was the beginning of the end, that she must have known it was all up. But Anne wouldn't have known that. No one considered for an instant that a Queen of England might lose her head. Sometime after arriving at the royal apartments at the tower, Anne was accused of a long list of sexual crimes and treasonous acts. We don't know how the news was broken to her or how she reacted. Henry, meanwhile, simply disappeared from public life, no doubt wanting to escape the hurt and embarrassment that his wife's trial would bring. I'm walking where the royal apartments used to be, where kings and queens stayed the night before their coronation, because to hold the tower was to hold London and was to indicate that you really held England. And of course, it was where Anne stayed on the night before her coronation and again on the night before her execution. It was also the site of the Great Hall, which held 2,000 people and where Anne's trial was held. Anne's trial took place in front of 2,000 people, and she was judged by a jury of peers led by her own uncle, the Duke of Norfolk. Surviving documents from the trial reveal some of the more salacious accusations levelled at Anne. Oh, I'm looking forward to seeing these. This document is an extraordinary one because it is a record of that trial. This is the indictment. This is the charges laid out against Anne. It says, for example, that Anne has diabolically seduced these men because of her frail and carnal appetites, because of her lust. It doesn't stop here. It goes on and on. Over here, it describes Anne's relationships with these various men. So it mentions here, for example, Henry Norris, and says that he has violated and carnally known the Queen. And then it mentions George Boleyn, Anne's brother. And this bit's particularly lurid. It says that she has allured the said George into putting his tongue in her mouth, and she has put her tongue in his mouth. This is a picture of Anne as sexual predator. And that's exactly how Henry wanted her to appear. No man could possibly keep control of a wife with such a depraved sexual appetite, not even the king. Henry was conspicuous by his absence from the trial. It was a tactic that completely rebounded on him. Henry stayed away because it was really humiliating for him to have his wife accused of adultery. It suggested at this time his lack of sexual dominance, his lack of sexual prowess. And indeed, that's precisely what came out of the trial. George Boleyn, Lord Rochford, Anne's brother, was given a piece of paper that he was told not to read out loud. But he did. 
and on it was the charge that he and Anne had laughed at the king's manner of dressing, had laughed at his terrible poetry, and above all, that Anne had said that the king was not skilful in copulating with a woman and had neither vigour nor potency. Remember, that's in front of that crowd of 2,000. Henry was right to stay away. Anne was convicted on all counts. She now had just three days to live. The outcome of Anne Boleyn's trial was never in doubt. By a jury loyal to the king, she was unanimously found guilty of adultery, incest and high treason. Sentenced to death and with nothing to lose, it was now Anne's chance to tell her side of the story. I am entirely innocent of all these accusations, so I cannot ask pardon of God for them. I have been always a faithful and loyal wife to the king. I've not perhaps at all times shown him that humility and reverence that his goodness to me and the honour to which he raised me did deserve. In some ways, Anne's trial speech is entirely straightforward. She says that she is innocent, that she has always been a loyal wife to the king. But then there's that curious line about not having shown him the humility and reverence that his goodness to her and the position to which he raised her justified. In other words, she's admitting that actually she's been a bit feisty, that perhaps she's spoken back, she's been out of line from time to time. She hasn't always been the wife that Henry wanted her to be. I confess. I have had fancies and suspicions of him, which I had not strength nor discretion to resist. But God knows, and as my witness, I have never failed otherwise towards him, and I shall never confess any otherwise. Anne claimed, both before and after taking the communion, that she was innocent, on peril of her soul's damnation. And I think she was. I also don't think there's any evidence to sustain the idea that Henry wanted to get rid of her. In fact, I think what happened to Anne was a terrible mishap, that actually Anne managed to look guilty when she wasn't. Her sophisticated conversational wit, her excellence at the courtly game, was where she came unstuck. Exactly what had beguiled Henry in the first place made her look guilty as sin. So like a Shakespearean tragedy, the king, feeling betrayed and hurt, sentenced the queen that he loved to death for crimes she didn't commit. I think that the concubine's little bastard Elizabeth will be excluded from the succession. and that the king will get himself requested by parliament to marry. The joy shown by the people every day, not only at the ruin of the concubine, but at the hope of Princess Mary's restoration is inconceivable. While Anne awaited her execution in her chambers at the tower, she may well have heard the commotion outside as the five men she was accused of sleeping with, including her brother, were beheaded. I can't begin to imagine how she must have felt. We can't be certain. But it is believed that this is the prayer book that Anne had with her in the tower. I spent a lot of time thinking about Anne's weeks in the tower, how she racked her brains, how she tried to figure out what had got her into that mess, the hysteria, the trauma, the terrible times she must have had. And the idea that she had this with her at the time and that I'm now holding it in my hands is something I can't quite express. 
This is the wonder of history, this tangible sense of reaching out to touch the past. And what's even more extraordinary about it is that Anne has written in it. Now, she probably wrote this some time before her execution, but what she wrote has a haunting resonance. It says, Remember me when you do pray, that hope doth lead from day to day. Remember me when you do pray, that hope doth lead from day to day. And she signed it, Anne Boleyn. Anne left her chambers at the tower a little before eight o'clock in the morning. Awaiting her at the end of this short journey was an expert French swordsman summoned by Henry as an act of mercy. For a dignified execution befitting a queen, a scaffold had been erected inside the walls of the tower, away from the public. An eyewitness reported Anne's final words. Good Christian people, I am come hither to die. For according to the law, and by the law, I am judged to die. Therefore, I shall speak nothing against it. I am come hither to accuse no man, or to speak anything of that, whereof I am accused and condemned to die. But I pray God save the king and send him long to reign over you all. For a gentler nor a more merciful prince was there never. And to me, he was ever a good, a gentle and sovereign lord. And if any person will meddle of my cause, I require them to judge the best. And thus, I take my leave of this world and of you all. And I heartily desire you all to pray for me. O oh Lord God, have mercy on my soul to Christ. I commend them. Jesus, receive my soul. O oh Lord God, have mercy on my soul. Please do receive my soul. Oh Lord God, bless you. The Queen of England was beheaded with a single clean strike of the French blade. This is the Chapel Royal of St Peter at Vincula, a parish church within the walls of the Tower of London. After Anne was executed, she was brought here to be buried, or at least most of her was. If they did what they did with other traitors, they would have taken her head, boiled it, tarred it, and put it on a spike on London Bridge before throwing it into the swirling Thames. But the rest of her is here, somewhere beneath my feet, and this is where she should be remembered. <laughs> <laughs> 